tonight on Pamela Wallen Live, SCTV Behind the Scenes with Dave Thomas, one of the original members, of course, of SCTV and the Second City Troupe, which is really where it all began. That's correct, on the stage. Did you know you were a funny bunch of people? Well, we heard the audience laughing. That's always a good clue. <laughs> well, we'll find out what was the glue that held this group together, SCTV, the Second City Crew, with Dave Thomas, right after the news. Comedian Dave Thomas introduced some new words into the Canadian vocabulary. Take off a hosers, those kinds of things. Not you don't want to be claim too much credit for that. No, I share the credit with Rick Moranis. <laughs> so or the blame. Yeah, or the blame. Dave Thomas is with us tonight, part, of course, of the original Second City troupe and uh, a group that went on to create a uh, late-night comedy called SCTV. What a group that eventually was there, John Candy and Catherine O'Hara and Andrea Martin and Joe Flaherty, Martin Short, Rick Moranis, Eugene Levy, what a gang. Um, and now you're starring in your own sitcom, Grace Under Fire. That's right. Do you like the, uh, the TV gig? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is much different than SCTV was. Yeah. SCTV was a grueling, demanding schedule, <clears throat> really for someone who has no family or no life. And at that time, I didn't. The show was my life. But now, I have three kids, I have a life, and the sitcom is perfect for it. Like, how long do you work in a day? Actually, um, I'll give you a quick rundown of the week. Monday, we're, we don't work at all. Tuesday, one hour. Wednesday, half a day, we're out by one, so we can have a one o'clock lunch. Wow. Uh, Thursday is usually a half day, a little later. Sometimes it goes to three. Friday, we start at noon, and we're out at six. And then we go two weeks on, one week off, three weeks on, two weeks off, on the average. This is a great life. It's better than being a postal worker. <laughs> okay, let's get back. We'll come back and, and talk a little bit more about your relationship with Brett Butler and all of that. Okay. But SCTV behind the scenes. Let me hold up this book. We'll see snippets out of it. But it's filled with pictures and memorabilia. Are you a pack rat? Is that where all this stuff yes, came from? I absolutely am. And uh, I, I don't know why I'm a pack rat. I still have my notes from high school that I took. So. <laughs> I just saved stuff. And I would see photos and things like that. I took photos in the writing room and things like that. And I just put it all away, filed it all away, and then... You weren't actually planning to do this way no, back then. It's absolutely just... not. I, I, in fact, even as recently as two years ago, I had no interest or thought about doing a book. Now, is everybody else mad at you because you've done this? Because no. this is now your take on it? No. Um, I, there's difference of opinion. I would be lying if I didn't say that. But uh, I sent the book to Joe when it's in manuscript form, Joe Flaherty, for yeah. his feedback because he was with the show from beginning to end. And yeah. Joe is very much a barometer of, you know, what's real, what, what's the, the true viewpoint on this. He read it, called me the next morning, said, Dingo, that's his nickname for me, Dingo. <laughs> he said, right on the money. He said, perfectly unbiased, couldn't put it down, great read, enjoyed it, and kind of got nostalgic and sad at points. I sent it to yeah. Rick Moranis. Yeah. Rick read it. He said, Dave, nobody's going to be mad at you for this. He said, it's a, it's a love letter to the cast. And uh, I sent, sent it to Marty. And Marty, who's more politically correct, said, you might want to change this. You <laughs> might want to soften this a little. But essentially, he loved it, too. So. But those were your <clears throat> observances then and your memories. You talked to other right. people and, and kind of put in their sure. view, too. Because one of the, uh, the producers that you quote in here, the associate producer, mm -hmm. he says, it was getting to the point where nobody liked anybody else's stuff but their own, mm -hmm. talking about the last days. Was that true? I think to some extent. I mean, you know, there is a competitive element of putting a show like this together. And I think we actually collaborated with each other far more than most casts do, but we were still very competitive and we wanted to put our own stuff in. And you each had your own characters. And right. And I think that we became kinder and gentler as the show went on and as we saw it in its various incarnations and form. And as we went from underdogs uh, to Saturday Night Live in a sad little half hour show to a much more interesting and successful show when it was a 90 minute network show. So. Um, 
I think by the time we got to that show, instead of being stakes or higher and we're very competitive with each other, it was more like, well, yeah, okay, you take that time. You, but you I, do that. I think it's also Rick that says in the book that as he looks back, and I think it is very nostalgic for all of you, obviously, that he wonders whether everybody's best work wasn't done at the beginning. Well, and you know what? That may be true. But, hey, at least we did our best work at some time, <laughs> you know? As opposed to never. <laughs> I, I would be, I, I, Howard Rosenberg of the LA Times wrote a very dramatic um, tribute to SCTV when this book came out. Uh, and uh, he laments that we may have done our best work at the beginning of our careers and, and then describes me uh, for the purposes of his dramatic article yeah. at the end as going back to feeding the pigeons in the park. Well, I mean... <laughs> what, meaning grace under fire? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, let's be fair about this. You know, I'm yeah. not Nik Nicholas Tesla, a mad inventor in a park throwing, <laughs> you know, seed at pigeons. I mean, you know, I'm enjoying my life right now, and I think everyone in the cast is. They all have and, different careers. And presumably and, so is the audience. It's a very popular show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, uh, you, that can be dramatized a bit too much. Yeah. I think that we all look back on it fondly. We all really enjoy the experience, and... Uh, and now we're on to other things. Okay, trace the, the history, because this is a group of people that, that got together at a place that was called Second City, an mm -hmm. idea that really originated in the States. But funny people here kind of picked up on it. When well, was that and how? Uh, 1974, I believe, they first opened a company on Adelaide Street. They couldn't get a liquor license. which In is, Toronto. Yeah, yeah, in Toronto. And that was... They couldn't get a liquor license, and that was death for a comedy club because you got to have liquor and you got to make it work like that. Anyway, that closed after about three months. But I went to see it when it was there, and I had taken a brief hiatus from showbiz because I couldn't get work, and I went into advertising as a copywriter. And I saw. That, hold on, that was a great story that you actually <laughs> went through the phone book. Yes. Phoning advertising companies in alphabetical order, and right. you got hired by the M's. I got hired by McCann Erickson. <laughs> And I would have gone all the way to the end and then started over. I was very determined, and I thought, this is something I could do. But anyway, <laughs> I saw this stage show with Dan Aykroyd, Gilda Radner, Valerie Bromfield, Joe Flaherty come up from Chicago with Brian Doyle Murray, Bill Murray's brother, yeah. and John Candy. What a cast. And I looked at that, and I thought, okay, that's it. That's what, that's what I want to do. And as luck had it, they then decided to open a Pasadena company when the Toronto company failed. And, uh, but Andrew Alexander decided to open another Toronto company at the fire hall. So they took three guys from the Toronto company, uh, Flaherty, Candy, and Levy, and sent them to Pasadena to open a company. And then there were openings. So I got into a company with Dan Aykroyd and these other people. I that mean, that's were, amazing. I had the best time. For a young comedian yeah. to be and rubbing And frightened out shoulders. of my mind, yeah. too. I mean, you know, improvising with these people who I had looked at and thought, wow, these people, the way their minds work is unbelievable. Yeah. And Danny was quite formidable at that time. I, I, I mean, still is, but, you know, he could improvise on virtually any subject at rapid fire speed. So you had to move like a bandit to keep up with him, you know? Yeah. And it was now exciting. Now, uh, what do you describe it as? What is that humor? Is it sketch comedy? I mean, is it stand-up? What is it? No, it's ensemble comedy. It, it's, it's a kind of comedy where, this is the stage we're talking about, right? Yeah. It's a kind of comedy where you, uh, by definition, are working with other people on the stage. So storming ahead and turning it into a monologue is bad etiquette. You, you cooperate, you work with the other people, you listen to what they say, you give them time to move, and there's nobody there who isn't funny. So presumably, with that kind of cooperative, collaborative effort, effort, you should be able to arrive at something greater than you could pull off individually. How come, and, and I pose this question as often as I can to the Leslie Nielsens of the world or the Frank Schusters of the world, do you name it, how come Canadians are funny? American people say this to me all the time, and they list Jim Carrey, Phil Hartman, right. Dan Aykroyd, John Candy, and, and, and Marty Short, and, and the list goes on. Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, th you can... This is a puzzling question. Nobody has right. the answer to this question. Well, I mean, <laughs> it could be that Marty Short's dad used to say that he described America as the excited states. He was an Irishman. Yeah. And he thought that you had a nice vantage point here, ringside table, kind of watching the madness, and that gave you an objectivity that allowed you to comment on it, but not necessarily be part of it. Maybe that's true. Yeah. Um, maybe it's just a regional thing. Maybe it just, w this is our time now, and then a flood of people are going to come from Arizona next. I don't know. <laughs> but I think that, you know, uh, 
there's no question that a lot of comedy has come from this country and that it is big comedy and bankable comedy and money-making yeah. comedy in, in America. And, uh, and the only thing that's odd about it is that, is that um, uh, people point to it and go, well, it's regional. It must be something in their food or in their water That's right. or something that they something that was down here at the fire hall that yeah. you guys were all yet exactly. drinking. I'm sure. All right, we're going to take a short break. Come back and continue, continue our conversation with Dave Thomas, SCTV behind the scenes, and we'll move from Second City to SCTV right after this break. I need a girl with a build. If I'm going to fall in love with her, it's got to be realistic for me. Realistic? I mean, it's exactly what I'm going for, you know? I mean, I don't want to mug or go too broad with this thing. Yeah, well, what's wrong with Anita Eckberg? At least she's, you know... Well, 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 what's with the hands? You want an actress with arthritis? <laughs> Our guest tonight, Dave Thomas, one of the stars of the sitcom Grace Under Fire, but he started way back when with Second City and SCTV, and now he has written a story and, I guess, a tribute, SCTV, behind the scenes. That's how you'd see it. Now, that little sure. bit of tape uh -huh. that we saw when we went to commercial, <clears throat> you doing Bob Hope. Right. Uh, did you ever, have you ever met him? Has he ever looked at it? Does he love you? Does he hate you? I actually showed that <laughs> tape and all the other pieces that I did where I impersonated him in 1982. I tracked him down. I was relentless. I don't know why. I was like Simon Wiesenthal trying to get this guy <laughs> and force him to sit through my tapes. And, um, and he watched it at that time, time and he said, you know, you got that voice down rich little. You know, he tried it, but he can't do it. That's why I'm that marvelous. And then as time went on, I ended up being on a couple of Bob specials. Yeah. And then I got invited to his house and play golf with him and now I get gifts from him every Christmas. Do you really? Yeah. Do they, do those guys like to mentor? I mean, was he sort of taking mm. you under? No, not really. They're very competitive too, you know, yeah. even at that age. I'll tell you a very interesting story. When, when he did his 90th birthday, yeah. I was told by uh, Don Misher, who's the producer, he said, now uh, Bob's getting on a bit. He probably won't get up. Uh, he probably won't recognize you because at one point I was supposed to go down after I'd done my little bit yes. as his nephew Chester Hope yes, I remember that. to say hi to Bob and Dolores. And he said, he won't get up, he won't recognize you, and he can't hear you. And I said, well, then why am I going down and talking to him? <laughs> and so I went down. Bob jumps up to his feet right away, and he says, hi, Dave, how you doing? And this is in front of an audience. He said, you know, it's been some time since Toronto there where we met. And I went, well, yes, we have. I mean, yes, it has, So Bob. much for... And then he starts uh, blocking me from the camera. So I cheat out a little bit. Yeah. And then he drifts over and blocks me again. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? It would be the yes. over-the-shoulder camera. Like, like this here. Exactly <laughs> right. So I couldn't believe that this guy was still, and I did it three times. And then finally, I, the only way I could stop him cold is I said, hey, Bobby, I can do something with my ski nose that you can't do. And he just went, oh, yeah, what's that? I said, I can take it off. And I ripped this prosthetic nose right off in front of him. And there was all this sponge matter and stuff underneath. And he just doubled up. He went nuts. So, I mean, I got my spot. You got you know, him. But I had to do something pretty <laughs> drastic to get him, you know. There haven't always, I suppose, though, been positive reactions when the victims or the subjects of all of this actually got to see the tape. Is there some couple of horror stories on well, that score? Well, I mean, I remember one time John Candy told me he met Michael Caine yeah. in a bar. And he said, Michael Caine said, I know who you are. And he said, it's that other bloke I want to get my hands on. And I'll wring his neck if ever I see him. And I, he was joking, it was yeah, very yeah. nice, of course. And then another time, we were taken, Moranis and I were taken out to a surprise um, dinner with Neil Simon. And yes. we didn't know he was going to be there. And I'd impersonated him on <laughs> right. CTV. And Andrea had played Marsha Mason, his wife at that time, yeah. sobbing, with no, no dialogue, just sobbing. That's every all time she ever did. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so uh, I was kind of embarrassed. I said, Neil, he said, I saw it. He said, it was wonderful. I loved it. And uh, I said, well, I, you know, I was, and he said, don't worry about it. He said, Marsha saw it, too. And I said, really, what did she think? He said, she cried. <laughs> <laughs> so most people have a sense of humor yeah. about all of this. Yeah, they do. Now, now, back to the SCTV, because that's what we promised. We would kind of trace the steps here after uh, Second City. Then mm -hmm. how did this happen? How did SCTV happen? Well, uh, around about 1975, Lauren Michaels started raiding the Second City stage companies for Saturday Night Live. That's he another Canadian. Correct. Right. And he scooped Dan uh, Danny and Gilda out of the Toronto company. Then he went fishing into Chicago, and he took Belushi out of there. And he was he was looking at Murray at that time. He ended up hiring him later. But Bernie Solms, who ran Second City out of Chicago, very upset and felt like he was being robbed. 
And so he decided, we'll do our own show. And he uh, and Andrew Alexander uh, put a troupe together, which became us. Now, I believe that I was the luckiest of the group, because I was the newest addition to the stage cast. And Bernie was just pulling people that he liked and that were doing good work at that time. And because and, he had been working with us, he yeah. saw me and knew me. But he took uh, Catherine O'Hara and myself and Candy, who were in the stage company at that time, out of the stage company. Uh, Andrea Martin had moved on, but he remembered her and liked this her. This is like hockey or football, egg for a player to be named later. That's right. Harold <laughs> Ramis was in L.A. He brought him up. Joe Flaherty was in Chicago. He brought him up, and yeah. then he put this team together. And we kind of limped along with a very, very low budget at Global and started doing these shows. Yeah, like a low budget, you mean a buck fifty. It really was. It really was. It was really low. How did you do that? I mean, because the characters, you had to work, you know, with not too much in terms of money. You had a great makeup artist or a team of makeup people to sort of capture that. Is it all in, in the style anyway? It doesn't really matter what you look like? Well, we were complaining at the time. I was, you know, very um, angry that we had so little for effects and sets. And I remember being very, you know, screaming at the producers, l literally screaming at the producers about it. And Harold Ramis tried to chill me out. He said, Dave, Dave, no, this is part of our charm. We are the small station that looks tacky and bad, and that's part of our charm. People will love that. And so we can thank Global for giving uh, us that <laughs> but little... But you've also described yourselves, and, and I mean, what motivated you is that you all were the children of television, and that's True. what you did. You mocked it. Mm -hmm. We Because we grew up on it. We understood yeah. it. We had a reference level that was fairly uh, extensive when you combined us all together in a room uh, of television and and we thought there were things about it that that could be made fun of you know including having no budget including having no budget <laughs> Dave Thomas is our guest tonight SCTV behind the scenes is the latest book of memorabilia that he has put together because he is a self-confessed pack rat and we'll continue our conversation with Dave right after this break on cookery crock you're going to be getting a chance to see Angus Crock, the gourmet chef, huh? What a... Ah! Ooh! That's hot! Ooh! Oh, oh, oh. Put these things on. Ah, anyway, we're going to be working on meals that you can prepare in your own home for next to nothing. Like this lovely casserole here that I showed you yesterday. A beautiful meal that will let you feed a family of four for only 98 cents. The Great White North, Bob and Doug. Well, of course, we've got one of them here tonight, Dave Thomas. <laughs> the whole creation of Bob and Doug McKenzie was a complete accident. Absolutely right. Brought about by <clears throat> the CBC, SRC, <laughs> Radio Canada. It, it, Tell this story. Well, the, Cana the CBC version of the show, when it was a half-hour show, was two minutes shorter than, or rather longer than the American version because they had two minutes less commercial, commercial content. Right, right. So uh, they asked us to give them two minutes of Canadian content. Now we were very insulted by that because we thought we are Canadian, we're doing a show in Edmonton, come on, what do you want? You right. know? And uh, they <laughs> said, well, we said to them in a joking but kind of mean-spirited, satiric way, would you like us to put up a map of Canada, drink beer, uh, fry back bacon, wear toques and parkas? Would, would that be Canadian enough for you? <laughs> they and said yes. They said yes. And if you could have a Mountie in it, too, that would be perfect. <laughs> so, uh, so we had a Mountie mug. But, uh, you know, if, if we had known that the secret to making something a kind of a, a cultural phenomenon was to start with a mean-spirited joke, we would have done that a little more often, you know? I, I can't resist. I think we should look at Bob and Doug just for a minute and okay. then come back and continue our conversation. Bob and Doug McKenzie. Hey, good day. Welcome to the Great White North. Go. Go again. Go, 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 go. Beautiful. Okay, good day. Welcome to Great White North. I'm Bob McKenzie. This is my brother, Doug. How's it going, eh? And whoa, you, did you hear about... What, well, you can tell. Okay, you hear about the guy who, like, uh, was opening a beer, eh, and, like, went to drink and then did the stupid thing of looking in the bottle and, whoa, there's a mouse in his bottle, eh? Real, real, real mouse. Well, I guess it, it was dead, right? Drowned from yeah. beer. And drunk, too. Drowned like it died, happy, it died too. It had from, a smile on its face, eh? It died it from down. drunk driving in the bottle. But you know what the guy got? Tell them. A whole case of beer. Right. So our topic today is how to stuff a mouse into a beer bottle without, uh, without breaking it, the it, bottle. its bones. Right. So that they'll look at it and give you a case and not think you hose them by, uh, by 
deliberately stuffing one in, eh? It's like ship building in a bottle, okay? Right. And like the thing to remember is, let's say you get, okay, let's say you get a six pack, right? Yeah. Six mice, right? Six mice. Okay, you get a case for each beer <laughs> bottle with a mouse. So a case of two, four, right? A square for like times six? It's six times 24. Jeez, I don't know. I don't have my calculator, eh? Okay, so I, I can't I, figure that six out. Six times four is 24. You gross me out on the air okay. and make me look dumb. No, I'll do it. You tell him more about it. Okay, four, so what you do is, the idea is to get a baby mouse that you can, four, like, put in an empty beer bottle and nine, feed it in the bottle for, like, a month. And then fill the beer bottle up with beer and put a cap on it. 104. Then, yeah, 104 beers you get just for that. <laughs> it is so stupid. When Rick took his glasses <laughs> off, he sort of glazed over because he couldn't see that well. And it made me laugh because he dro his IQ dropped about 40 points. <laughs> when he took and, his glasses off. And I actually would say to the kid, because I was actually intrigued by this, I'd say, yeah. zoom in on my brother's face. Look how dumb his stare is. Look how <laughs> stupid he looks, you know. Now, did you write any of this stuff or did you sit down and just make it up? Completely improvised. Yeah. Um, what we would do is we'd send the entire crew uh, home and the cast home. They would keep one cameraman and a switcher <laughs> and we would do maybe 10 of these two minute things. They'd count us in and uh, maybe two would be good. And, but as far as they were concerned, for about you know a 40 minutes, 45 minutes of shooting time to come up with four minutes of programming, exactly. that was a good shooting ritual. Oh, so they were happy with that. <laughs> now you had from time to time, but very occasionally, guests on there. And we mm -hmm. know this because a couple of weeks back we had Tony Bennett mm -hmm. on the program and he actually did a guest appearance with That's Rob right. and Doug. That's right. How did that happen? Well, we had, when the show became a 90 minute show, NBC insisted that we have musical guests. So we decided, okay, fine. So we're not going to have a bunch of your stinking rock bands that you want. <laughs> so we had like Itzhak Perlman. We had uh, some rock bands, but ones that we Good liked. Good ones. Tony Bennett. We had people that we liked, you know, yeah. Roy Orbison. So. Uh, we had Tony, he, other than my brother Ian, Tony was the only guest that ever appeared on the Great White North set with us. And uh, Ian, your brother the musician. Ian, my yeah. brother the musician. And so we, we were w really happy to have him on and, uh, and uh, Tony has said to me at, uh, since then that he believes that this sort of helped his, the renaissance of his career. Yeah, no, he did absolutely say that. And his, it was when his son had taken over, I guess, managing, right. and he right. thought this would kind of make Tony yeah. more cool and with it. Yeah, and he was cool and with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, the guy, what, what's great about Tony is he has a style and it is endured, and, yeah. you know, it's good. Yeah. Now, you, I mean, did you have any idea that this was going to take off and become, I mean, in 1982, we were experiencing Bob, uh, Bob and Doug, you know, frenzy. Mm -hmm. No, we had no idea. I mean, obviously, if we had, we would have done it sooner. <laughs> I mean, uh, good we, point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, what what makes people grab onto something like that and 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 go with it is completely beyond me. But our first indication of it was um, when we were taping the show in Edmonton. We had no contact with an audience at all. We were just right. shipping tape out. We got an invitation to go to um, uh, Saskatchewan to be the guests of the cheerleaders of the Regina Rough Riders. Uh, yeah, of, the Saskatchewan of the Rough, Rough Riders. Riders right. And Rick and I went, geez, how bad could that be, eh? So <laughs> they wanted, Bob, they were fans of Bob and Doug. So we thought, we thought it was kind of cute. When we got off the plane there, there were like hundreds of people cheering us when we got off the plane. We couldn't believe it. And that was our first real experience. So this had connected somewhere yep. out there. And then we saw nobody spray paints slogans on overpasses in Canada, but we saw take off eh, on an, on an yeah. overpass and we went, oh, geez, what is this? Yeah. What have we tapped into here? Did it kind of concern you at a certain point that, I mean, that young kids were growing up wanting to be hosers and drink beer and act stupid? Yeah. And in the movie, we were very careful, uh, you know, to, uh, you can't drive, I'll drive, eh, because you've been drinking, you know, to do little things, like little yeah. reminders like that. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, yes, we did feel responsible, but it was something that went ahead of us and developed a life of its own. Yeah. And we were really passengers on this ride. And but as a comedian where you work, when you work on characters and you work on bits, and then, as you say, you sit down just because the CBC said it wanted two minutes of Canadian content, didn't much care what, and you make this stuff up, mm -hmm. and that's the huge hit. I know. It, it was ironic 
and it let you see how powerless you are really <laughs> at crafting the direction of your own career you know I mean if we had known we would have done it earlier as I said but you know these are things that just happen on their own and you just got to go with it so you don't resent it in a way no yeah. no not at all Dave Thomas is our guest tonight he has put together a book called SCTV behind the scenes so it's an excuse to talk about all of that we'll continue our conversation with Dave about the times then and what he's doing now right after this break Dave Thomas is our guest tonight, the star of Grace Under Fire, and many, many years as a star of SCTV. Now, I'm amazed to say that you are still awake as we sit here tonight. <laughs> Do I look tired? The uh, stewardess said that on yeah. the plane last well, night. Well, you did fall asleep during an interview with David Letterman. All right, yes, that's what quite true. What were you true. thinking? I know. <laughs> well, I had done 12 interviews that day in New York. I was very tired, and Rick took the hot seat, namely sitting beside David. Right. I was kind of on the end. And they got talking, and they seemed to have a good rhythm going, and I just kind of nodded off. And then the next thing, I feel Rick tapping me, and it's like one of those moments uh, driving on a, on a highway at night where you wake up 10 miles past where you were and go, how did I get here? And I hear Rick saying, I can't believe he fell asleep on network TV. I mean, Rick didn't even cover for me, you know? And, uh, but did, did everybody think it was a joke? I don't know what they thought, but I was really embarrassed. I, I said immediately, I said, well, I mean, you know, I got sick of listening to you guys talk about yourselves, you know. But <laughs> Nice recovery. <laughs> <laughs> and now, have you ever been back on Letterman? I have, and actually it didn't go that well. So I don't know whether... <laughs> he a, holds a grudge, does I he? I don't know. <laughs> talk a little bit about, because when you were talking about Bob and Doug McKenzie, um, you know, and that you didn't realize it till you kind of came out of the closet and went to the, the Rough Riders uh, event in Saskatchewan and, and everybody was, you know, there. Well, you, because you do so many characters, in those days, did people ever recognize you, like when you were walking down the street? Uh, not as much. I mean, it wasn't really until Bob and Doug hit that people started recognizing us. You know. And they would recognize you even sort of out of character? Does that mm -hmm. trouble you at all? Well, it did. It became <laughs> tough when, I mean, I like to leave all my Christmas shopping till the very end. Yes. Because I love the excitement of it, you know, yeah. and just bustling around and the music and everything. And when people are stopping you for autographs like every three feet, it slows you down. You, you cannot can't get, get your shopping you done. can't get your shopping done. I became very frustrated with that. <laughs> you know, now people will say to me, oh, boo-hoo, Dave, were you too big a star and making so much money yeah. that you couldn't do your Christmas shopping? Yeah, okay, there's an element of that that's true that I have to acknowledge. But uh, still, it was one of the sort of sides to success that I'd always been wishing for success, but then when it actually hit, it kind of alarmed me a little bit, you know? Yeah. Now, did that start to break away at the group, too, in any way? I mean, as you say, you kind of all like doing your own shtick best. Well, I, I, honestly, I think the when Rolling Stone put SCTV's best joke, referring to Bob and Doug McKenzie on their cover, I, I and think... And called it, it SCTV's best joke. I yeah. think that was unfair, and so did everyone, and things like that didn't help. Mm -hmm. the, the reality of it is, it wasn't our best joke. It was some writer's opinion at Rolling Stone that at that time it was a good joke but he went too far and and, and that was hurtful I think to people and uh, I know I would have been I would have been bugged by that if it had been yeah. somebody else doing moronic characters you know if it had been something that we all uh, as a group agreed agreed was our best joke that would be different you yeah. know and there were things that we all did that we thought were clever or that other people did that we would acknowledge and go well that was smart that was clever but something that was just like a stupid fluke like that being written up as the best joke that was that wasn't right you know and so I think you know that but I'll tell you something though we were always a family, and even though that was a little bit of a problem, it was never uncivil. We still stuck together. And, and could people talk about it? Were you frank enough with each other that you could say, that really made me mad, you know, not you, but the other guys who were... I, I, again, there's seven very different people yeah. who have very different personalities, so some people talked about it, some people didn't, you know? Yeah. But I'm sure it was a pain to everyone, you know? And it was, you know, honestly, it was a pain to Rick and I, too, because yeah. we even believe from the point of view of our own work, that that was an insult, right. that we would far rather have been praised for our Woody and Bob Hope, you know? Okay, so what was SCTV's finest moment and Dave Thomas's finest moment? Personally, I think it was when we were all in sync doing the 90-minute show. That was when 
the cumulative experience of the three years of the half hour show had kind of got us up to being seasoned pros. Mm. The challenge of the 90 minute show gave us a real tough mountain to climb. Delivering that much material three times a month, really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Then um, just, you know, energies connecting, at the, being at the right time in the right place. Um, it was almost a fluke that that happened. First of all, the half hour show when um, ITV picked it up in Edmonton got put on NBC O and O's following Saturday Night Live and it ended up holding the audience. Yeah. So NBC paid attention to that and they decided to go for it, you know. And then um, Rick and I had already, we figured SCTV wasn't going to happen again. We were in LA uh, and we had sold a, a two-hander, a show with the two of us, to <laughs> CBS. And when John Candy phoned us and said, come on guys, you got to come back and do SCTV. I mean, we're all going to be in this together. It's going to be great. It's going to be a 90-minute show. It's a monster, but it's going to be great. And we looked at each other and went, all right, let's go. And, and you we, walked away we from... We scuttled the, the two-hander and we went back to uh, Toronto to work Was that on. the right thing to do? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So that was the finest time and, and what was... I, I think, and I think everyone in the cast had their finest moment in, in at that run. At some point or another in that in run. In that run. I remember being at the, um, at the Emmys and watching Eugene's Perry Como, yeah. where he's laying down, singing a song, and the whole, this is like everyone who is anyone in television, right. screaming with laughter and applauding. I mean, I was so proud of him at that time that it was just great. It was amazing. When I saw the finished version of the Godfather piece that the Flaherty brothers had worked on, I thought it was so good. I mean, they even had John Marley, who was in the cast of The Godfather, playing a role in The Godfather. <laughs> everyone pulled together, you know. I mean, everyone had a, a really great moment. Some of Catherine's and Andrea's impersonations and things that they did at that time were just were unbelievable. They were so good that people were going, is that, her? Is that really her? You yeah. know, I mean, they were really stunned with it. and. So, I mean... And what's your favorite? I mean, if, when you slip back into character, which one is it? Well, I, the, the, it isn't a character that I like yeah. the most. It's a show called The Russian Show, where we... The concept of that was that the Russians jammed the SCTV satellite and inflicted their programming on us. Now, originally, when we sta sat around brainstorming, some of the writers said, uh, well, how about a, a Russian version of The Tonight Show? I said, no, no, no. This has got to come from the Russian mentality. Right. We don't know what they're watching over there because right. there was still an Iron Curtain then. But let's try to imagine from what we know of them what their shows would be like. And I came up with this thing called What Fits Into Russia. And the concept of it was a big Velcro map of the Soviet Union and Velcro cutouts of all the other countries. And the, all they did on the show was hung up the other countries and laughed and mocked at how small they were compared to the vast size of Mother Russia. <laughs> now that nailed the Russians on their philosophy of big is best. It was in their military. It was in everything that they did. It was in their architecture, their yeah. heroic statues. And I thought that was real smart. And then the idea started tumbling in and that somebody came up with John Candy in a show called Hey Yorge where he was the mythological spirit of communist goodwill just going <laughs> around helping people solve problems and I was so pleased with that show it was very upbeat very eclectic probably didn't appeal to a wide audience but I personally loved it. But it would also be huge in the US where that su was such a focal point at that point I mean the Cold War. Well maybe I mean r the reality of it is the stuff that is huge in the U.S. is not always the smartest stuff. No, yeah. So you know, um, I don't know if it, I don't know the answer to that. I can was you? Are, are you still a bit of a snob about that? And I say that in the nicest possible way. That in fact, the American audience is different. Well, they are different. There's no question about that. But there's two audiences that we should be aware of. That and this isn't a national thing. There is the individual audience and this is a specialty audience that will tune into a specific thing and whether it's a and e or whether it's right. wh whatever it is and then there's the mass audience the mass audience is stupid there's no question <laughs> about it if you want 40 million people to watch your show every week you cannot aim too high we're going to the lowest common denominator here are we uh, i mean i've we've all <laughs> tried so many of us have tried to do smart programming in prime time and we have just got nailed <laughs> nailed tonight behind the scenes at SCTV with Dave Thomas. We'll continue in a moment. Did, did you have a chance to read the script? Did, did you like it or what? I didn't read it all, but I read it far enough to see where it was going. I just thought it was a little bald on jokes, that's all. Bald on jokes? What, what does the script need, a toupee or something? Uh -huh.
Dave Thomas is our guest tonight from SCTV, from Grace Under Fire. Every one of those clips that we look at as we go off to commercial, you and Rick, are you still friends after all oh, yeah. this time? Yeah, I talk to him almost every day. And in fact, we've started writing together again, and we have a script in the works now that we're, we're pretty happy about. This could be dangerous. It could. <laughs> a movie or? Yes, it's yeah. a movie script, and it, it will use as its springboard the brothers. We're bringing the Mackenzies back. Uh-oh. And here's why. Rick and I both believe that <clears throat> to wait 15 years to bring the brothers back was so lame that it was good. It was typical <laughs> of the McKenzie brothers to do something like now, that. Now, will they really be older? Well, we're older. Yeah, we're, you so think you're going to go to some there. rejuvenation clinic in Switzerland? <laughs> no, we will be older. And still sitting there. Oh, yeah, and, well, they moved around in Strange Brew a little bit, but yeah. as little as possible. Yeah, and still drinking beer. I mean, you haven't moved on to martinis and cigars no, no, or anything. No, it, no, It just wouldn't be you. We maybe do a little less of that beer because <laughs> we both have a different attitude to it now. Yeah, well, you've got kids. That's right. You, how old are your kids? Uh, six, nine, yeah. and 12. And so do they watch all this stuff? No. Because it's not available. They no, watch. but I mean on tape. They must. I mean, if you're a pack rat, they must have access to this. N stuff. The tapes are at my office, and yeah. I'm I, I'm going to bring some of them home. They've seen some of my other stuff, but um, they they're into their own stuff, and I'm very rarely. What do they think is funny? Uh, they like um, cartoons, Nickelodeon. <laughs> um, my oldest son is a horror movie buff and loves anything scary, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really enjoy sitting. We all watch The Simpsons together as a, as a family and uh, Home Improvement. <laughs> you do? You yeah. watch The Simpsons? Absolutely. You I love that, that show. You do? Yeah, I'm a, I was a you guest on that show. You know that's politically incorrect. What, to watch The Simpsons? Yeah, I think you're not supposed to be saying that in oh, public. Oh, man, it's one of the best <laughs> written shows in, in, in Hollywood. I, I, think now, it's, I think it's a good show. Do the kids watch Grace Under Fire? It's on too late for them because oh, okay. it's a school night and they have to be in bed and it's not until 9 30. and you're so. a serious disciplinarian are you no but i mean uh the sooner they go to bed the sooner i have a few <laughs> minutes to myself <laughs> uh, how did you get onto grace uh under fire how did that all happen well um they called me in for a meeting yeah. uh tom warner and marcy carsey and they said we're doing a show with brett butler and we're looking for somebody you know to play opposite her and uh and I said, all right, and I talked to them for a little while, and they gave me a tape of Brett's stand-up to look yeah. at. And I looked at the tape, and I said, okay, so now what? And they said, would you like to meet her? I said, yeah, sure. So I met her, and uh, we, you know, joked back and forth and headed off, and they said, so do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, let's give it a whirl. I had never done a sitcom, and I thought, this is interesting. Plus, if it hits, it will plant me in L.A. Yes. It'll put me on that sitcom schedule, which is great, and I'll be able to spend more time with the family. Yeah, so. because that is a good schedule, as you described oh, before. Now tell, for those few rare individuals out there who have never seen Grace Under Fire, give us the plot in 30 seconds or less. Yeah. Well, it's a single mother trying to raise kids and struggling against all the obstacles that single mothers struggle against. And I play her pal, her platonic pal, Russell Norton, a pharmacist. And uh, we just, uh, you know, you're a get loser. Basically, life. you're a loser. No, not at all. I mean, <laughs> I'm successful in business. I own yes. two pharmacies, but you know, um, I've been divorced from my wife, and I have a kind of a an ongoing battle with the ex. But uh, <laughs> that may be what prompted you to say that. Yes, well, and all there's right. some real life. But let's take a look at Dave Thomas and Brett Butler in Grace Under Fire. Nothing wrong. Well. Spot went to live someplace where there's great big squirrel oak trees, and I know you're going to miss him, but he's got a kajillion little squirrel buddies and peanuts as far as the eye can see. What are you talking about? Great, great. For, for God's sake, she's, she's just a little girl. Let me handle this. <laughs> Let me. <clears throat> Sometimes animals get sick, and that's sad because we love them. Now, we weren't sure what was wrong with Spot, so to be sure, we sliced off his head and examined his brain. Honey, wait, I'll, I'll be right there. Why don't you come back about nine and read him a bedtime story, Russell? Well, I didn't even get to the ironic part where it turns out the squirrel was okay and the whole procedure was for nothing. <laughs> It is very, I mean, it's deadpan, it's funny, your character doesn't ever guffaw. Mm -mm. But you always manage to make her laugh in real life on the set. Yeah, yeah. We have a good thing going, we bounce yeah. things back and forth, and we'll do one take for real, and then we'll start clowning around and do other stuff. 
so that the Christmas party out reels are always good. They're great, yeah. <laughs> you have been dubbed the sexiest unhunk in Hollywood <laughs> for that. Oh, man. Boy, <laughs> are they a, hard up is for... Is that a compliment? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I don't know. I was embarrassed by it, and, you know, I... I don't ever listen to anything like that that's written about me because if you listen to anything Everybody that's good, says that. Do you really not that's do That's really it? true. It, it scares me. I remember when people were talking about how great we were when we were doing Second City and I was just like, ah, shut up, shut up, shut You'll up. You'll jinx it. Yeah, and not only that, if you listen to the good stuff, then you have to listen to the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So I can now ignore the bad stuff with a clear conscience, knowing that I didn't listen to any of the good stuff. You know? Does having your kids around, you and your wife are divorced? Mm -hmm. And s or split. I'm remarried, yes. Yeah, but you have your kids from... Yes. And you have them, what, on kind of a once... Literally half a week, half three and a half days a week, just chop right down the middle. Has that really fundamentally changed your view? On everything, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it was like uh, being hit in the head with a mallet, and it changed my the way I live my life, the way I do everything, the way I work, changed everything, uh, without question. And even the Bob and Doug McKenzie script, it's going to change. Yeah. You take uh, some of that beer. Is that yeah. really because of that? Well, it's, you feel a, an obligation to be responsible. And um, I got offered a part in a Showtime show. And it was with a friend of mine. But it involved this woman taking off her top. And I said, I can't be in that. And he said, well, Dave, it's a joke. I mean, she, she, I said, look, here's the deal. Whether it's a joke or not, the kids' teachers could be watching right. it. I, I mean, I can't, sorry, I can't. do. If you take that bit out, I'll do it. And it wasn't because I'm a prude or I yeah. think I've got these standards or anything. I just can't be a dad saying, this is wrong, this is right, and then have them go, well, what about this what are you doing? on TV, you know? Dave Thomas, our guest tonight, will be back with a, a final few comments and thoughts. Some final words about SCTV behind the scenes, too. Don't go too far away. You're right not to take money from relatives. That's a recipe for disaster. Right you are about that, Dad. You should take money from Rusty. <laughs> Grace is in a serious situation here. This is no time to joke. Russell, I know you enough to know how uncomfortable parting with money makes you. Don't worry about it. Grace, it's not that I'm cheap. You'd have more chance stealing a lamb bone from a Doberman. <laughs> All right, I'm going to prove you wrong, old man. Grace, I'd love to help. <laughs> Dave Thomas is our guest tonight, and we're talking about SCTV behind the scenes. I guess no conversation would be complete without a few words about John Candy. Mm-hmm. You he's miss a, him? Oh, sure. He's yeah. a good pal, you know? Yep. It's, it, I actually read I, somewhere that you said you, you wouldn't even take his name out of the Rolodex for a long time. It was kind of like, he's going to be there. He's going to call me. It's still there. Is it still I there? I will never take it out. No. Um, <laughs> it's still there. Uh, John was away a lot because he did a lot of movies and he yeah. was always very busy. So you got used to, you know, getting in touch with him by phone. That's the thing I miss most is I can't phone him, you know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I loved him a lot and uh, we clowned around a lot and had a lot of fun together and yeah, he's a great guy. Do you ever feel like when you look back on, on all of these days that, that that was the group of people with which you really connected? That's who understood you? Sure, yeah. absolutely. I mean, and it was very family in that they not only uh, tolerated you because of your idiosyncrasies, but I think they, we all loved each other because of our idiosyncrasies. That, that became part of the affection, you know, that the things that were odd and eccentric and sometimes yeah. downright unlikable about every one of us were part of what we loved about each other, you know? I mean, when you work that intensely and that closely and for long hours and all the rest of it, you do really see the worst of people, too, not just the best of them. Absolutely. And, you know, it was funny, somebody asked me um, a couple of days ago uh, during an interview, they said, Dave, is there anything you would change if you could go back? And I said, yes, I'd probably change everything, you know? <laughs> I mean, I think I'd be you a little... You don't really mean that, do I you? mean that in some ways, sure. I mean, there are things that I would do that now I think that I have a better perspective on that I could change and make better. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I, I, it's not that I have regrets about any of those choices. Those... Those were the choices that led me to where I am. But, you know, if I had a chance to go back and change things and improve them, I certainly would, yeah. Now, will there ever be an actual reunion? Well, that's funny. You know, I mean, if I were to say no, then there would. So, <laughs> no. I mean, you know, I, I think that 
it really depends upon, you know, events and circumstances and who calls it, who blows the whistle, you know. Uh, yeah. But I mean, th it would be difficult to do any more than a one-shot thing because our schedules are so complicated. Right. And Eugene lives in Toronto, Rick's in New York, most of the rest of us are in Los Angeles. Yeah. And at some point or other, someone's off doing a movie and somewhere else. Would that else. humor still work? Today? Yeah. Mm. I don't think we would do that humor. We're all different people now, and I think we would do a different version of it. Now, whether that would still be funny or whether it would be different or whether people would say, we've lost it or whatever, I don't think we would come back and do the exact same stuff that we did. I, I know I couldn't. And in talking to Rick and Marty and people like that, they wouldn't either, you know, so. But you could still use the parody form and... Probably. I, I, yeah. I think there would be no reason to go back and invent a new bucket to throw our ideas in. That was a good <laughs> one, you know. Was it fun putting the book together? Yeah, it was a, a I un completely underestimated the difficulty and enormity yeah. of the task, which I frequently do, and say yes <laughs> to something. About life. Oh, and then, <laughs> then I have the reality of doing it, and it was just like, why did I ever agree to do this? Well, but, we're very glad that you agreed to do that, because the book is great, and it also gave us an opportunity and a reason to get together and talk. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's a pleasure being here. Dave Thomas, SCTV Behind the Scenes. Now, here's a little reminder about what you will see on the program next week. Al Johnson will be with us, a longtime civil servant in this country. He is now Nelson Mandela's right-hand man in South Africa. We'll meet some of the stars of the new hit musical, Ragtime, as well. On Tuesday, Johnny Cochran will be here. O.J.'s defense lawyer. On Wednesday, you'll meet an incredible Canadian citizen, Diane Dupuis, who has put together something called the Famous People Players. This is a group of developmentally challenged and handicapped individuals who take their work to the black light stage, and it is really remarkable, and so is she. Thursday, a trip to the North Pole. We'll just check in with Santa Claus, and uh, Friday, you will a wonderful night of music as we celebrate the Christmas season. Afra Horner will be here. She'll be performing with Brent Carver, Albert Schultz, and Amy Skye. Ben Hepner will be with us, the tenor, Molly Johnson. The list goes on. Don't miss that. So it's going to be a great week next week. Have a good weekend. We'll see you Monday. Pamela Wallen's wardrobe is provided by the Matinee Fashion Foundation's award-winning Canadian designers.